Now let us turn our Bibles to continue in 1 Samuel. And now we come to chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. We have just read the account of how the Philistines, while well, they gathered to confront the armies of Israel. Between two mountains, there was a valley in between them. And we read about this Goliath. The Bible tells us about his size, right? A giant, while well, standing and challenging the armies of Israel. He's basically saying, well, why bother to fight? All right? Now, please look at verse chapter 17. Now, um, verse 8. Now, he stood and cried. Now, why you come out to set your battle in array? Now, why bother to gather everyone? Why don't you do this? In verse 9. Well, just send one person to represent Israel. Like I am represent, representing um, the Philistines. Come and fight me. All right? Don't bother with all these long-drawn battles. If you win, if, you, if your person can win, then we will serve you as your servants. But if we win, then you will be our servants. Now, it is also at this time that, well, David was instructed by his father to, well, bring some ration to his three other brothers who are out in the battlefield and to find out how are things faring. And it has been 40 days 40 days just in this so-called deadlock, all right? Waiting, who would move first? Now, it is then when David, as he was arriving at the camp, bringing these things, that, well, Saul began to go into the valley, well, let the people, and at least begin to engage in some smaller battles in the valley. Now, it is again at this point of time that, well, Goliath will come again and shout at, why bother to fight in the valley? Why have the armies engaged each other? And the Bible tells us that, well, he said the same things to them again. Just send someone out and fight me. Let's just settle this easily, once and for all, all right? One on one. So he challenged them again. Now, it is at this point that the people, well, they scurried back, all right? Now, if you look at verse 24, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, you know, Goliath, fled from him and were so afraid, they just scurried back. And also, David was there at the time, and they said, well, David, have you seen this guy? All right, have you seen this guy? And they began to tell him, you know, well, if anyone can defeat this guy, well, there will be rewards from the king. Probably the king will give him riches, spare him from taxes, his whole family from taxes forever, and even give his daughter to this man, all right, to be wife. So, and David asked, what will be done to this man? And they said the same thing again. Now, that was recounting what happened. Now, David said, well, why are we like that? And the brothers, the brothers looked at him and said, I know. You are curious. You are a busy body, all right? You are just, well, wanting to um, find out what is happening. That is all, all right? What, have you, what, what are you doing here? And it is at this point that David kept asking, what have I done? Is there not a cause? What have I done? And David turned again and again to people. What have I, now, is there not a cause? Now, what are we to learn from this event that God gave such detailed account about? What is there for the believer to learn? Well, today, we focus especially on one of the central verses in verse 26. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God. Now, this is that huge contrast that you will see in this very dark moment of Israel, Israel's history. People were fearful. They were trembling. They were just scattering and hiding, all right? But here is this young shepherd boy saying these words, 
Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that should defy the armies of the living God? What a difference in character, in attitude. Now, the title today is Living God, Living Faith. David used a specific description of the God of Israel. He would say, the living God, the living God. God. What made David so different from the rest? What made him so courageous? What constituted his faith? Well, his view of God is what made the difference. The living God was the words that he would choose naturally that would come out of his heart because that was what was in his mind and that was what was in his being. This is the living God and the armies of the living God that this uncircumcised Philistine is defying. Now, Christians, the first thing we want to learn is, I think there is a grave danger for us to fall into this rut, right, in our faith, to become like this Saul, look at verse 11, when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Saul and all Israel. Look at verse 21. For Israel and the Philistines when they gathered, and then, and then it says again in verse 24, and all the men of Israel saw the men and fled. Now we can fall into a life that we say he is God, but actually don't have the reality that he is the living God. And as a result, we can actually live a Christian life like these people, in fear, in failures, no victories. They worshipped God. We've been following their life. They had many sacrifices, worship. They had, they, they openly said that this is God. Well, they had the the ark, right? They were obsessed with the ark. They served God. They had the priesthood. They learned God's word. Samuel taught them, the Bible tells us. So they had learning. They had worship. They had, they had service to God. They had belief in this God. They believed that Jehovah is God. Now, isn't that very much like us? All these things we do and all we say, this is God. We will not believe in any other gods. We know that all other gods are false. We will not change from Christianity. You see, God to us, well, God is true. God is true, this God of ours. But there is a very big, big disconnect, unlike David, right? For us, like, the, like Saul and all Israel, the disconnect between a head knowledge. We know it so well. We, we can defend the truth of God. We can be so convincing in telling people why this God must be the only true God that we should turn to. Now, there is lots of doctrinal and theoretical knowledge and belief that He is indeed the true God. But the problem is this, the disconnect between the head and the realization of the heart that he is the living God. The grasp in our soul, in, our, in every fiber of our being that he is the living God. Not just the God on paper, on ideas, on concept, to us, there lies a very big gap. And that is why we behave very often like Saul and the Philistine, uh, and the, all Israel in our lives. Now, for David, God was the living God. Now, I'm not for a moment um, denigrating or discouraging the study of God's Word as much as possible. With all your energy, with all your heart, study the doctrines about God. 
study the doctrines in scriptures. I'm not for a moment saying that it's no use. I'm not for a moment saying that don't waste your time doing that. All right? The only way we can get the true knowledge, the right knowledge about God is what he has revealed himself through the word. So we must go to the word. But what I'm saying is this. Like Saul and all Israel, we know, but we don't grasp the reality. That is our problem. We study, we know. But God doesn't seem to be like a being, a reality that is as real as the person sitting next to you when you go home, the people at home, a being, a reality. God doesn't seem to be that in our hearts. Now that is how David, how differently David views God. Now how different will we be if God is truly living a reality to us. In fact, the Bible uses the living God very often. All right? Now, I'm not for a moment saying that you, you don't have um, a grasp of God as a living God if you don't, if you don't use the word living all the time. All right? If you say God, then oh, you, you don't have faith. I'm not saying that for a moment. The Bible uses God in many places. And the Bible also very often includes the word living to bring the readers back to the reality. It's almost like a wake-up call. Hey, hang on. You know, I keep telling you I'm God, but I need you to know that I'm the living God. Please awaken to that fact. So the Bible, in both in the Old and the New Testament, frequently uses the word living God in its, in its description to, um, about God to unbelievers. When Paul preached the gospel, he often uses the word the living God. In the description about God to the believers, the Bible also uses the word living God. At this point, I want to ask any one of you who have not come to this God as your God and your Savior, you may think, well, it's just a religion, right? Everyone has a religion, so these people have picked this religion. I'm interested, so I'll come and listen. Or maybe some of you have been here for a long time and it's just a religion to you. Practical, practically, he is not your God. If you are not a believer, you have to realize this is not just the true God, but he is the living God that exists, that knows of your existence, that tells you that one day he will judge you for your sins. It doesn't mean you die and it's all over. You will meet the living God. Your soul will meet this living God as your judge, and there is eternal judgment. But God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to pay for sins. Would you turn to him and receive him as your savior today? He is living. He is not an idea, a religion, a concept, that is all, that gives you some moral um, um, guidance, a moral compass for your life. No, he's a living God that we have to be accountable to. Now, for, the, for those who have been a Christian for a long time, I hope that God is truly a living God to you. There's an understanding of that, a fear that a judgment will come one day. This is not a religion. Now, I heard of a Christian who goes for Bible studies all the time, right? And even someone who, could, who, who quoted, for example, um, Calvin's Institute, and this person could correct the person. No, it is wrong. What you say is not precise. He was so accurate in his understanding of so many things about God. But no one realized that he was not really saved. Right? He even invited people to go to church. And people got saved through his, through his bringing and then they came to know the Lord personally. But yet, this person always in his heart, this was just an idea, all right? an ideal that has very good teachings. It was only when he was about to go for a life-threatening operation that he came to realize he must begin to ask himself, is this real? Right? Is this God real? Or is this an idea, a religion that I've chosen? So please, for those who profess to be believers, search your own hearts. Is he real? 
When you're on your knees praying to Him, when you're reading the Bible, is it a religion or is God real, living? Now we come to the lesson here. Now what, is, what are some of the things we can learn about having living faith? You have, if your view of God is a, He's the living God, your faith will be a living faith. Now what are some characteristics? All right. Well, the first response, the first change, all right, you, you will begin to experience this. Look at David, who had the idea, this is the living God, and how did he respond? The first lesson, all right, first lesson is, we will not fear when others are trembling. We will not have fear even when others are trembling. Now, look at the situation here, all right, look at the situation here. They've been having a face-off for 40 days. Then it is when David went there that, well, there was some battle that began. Look at verse 19. Now Saul and, and they and all the, the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. Now it began. So now it is, there is the, the battle, but there was confusion, all right? Confusion. Because when, when Goliath turned up and confronted them the, another time, now, what happened was, we, we saw earlier on, right? Verse 24, And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were so afraid. So, going out to battle, and then people rushing back, and there was battles, battle sound, right? The Bible tells us um, there were battle sounds in verse, um, in verse 20, right? The host was going forth to fight and shouted. So, it was a situation of confusion, noise, Seeing people running all over, scurrying as this group scurrying back, bump into David. And they said, David, have you seen this person? Oh, we are finished. Look at what they say. Look at verse 25. The men of Israel said, have you seen this man that is come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up and it shall be that the man and so on. All right, so now in the midst of all this noise, chaos, fear that you see in everybody's faces around you. But David just simply said, who is this Philistine? Who is he? It's almost like, now, who is this man that, that will cause all of you to be in such panic? Are we like that? When we have a view of God as the living God, our faith will be a living faith such that even when your colleagues, your friends, or maybe now we read about all the wars and rumors of wars and all the problems in the world, right? everyone is worried financially, right? physically, all kinds of worries. Or maybe when you are working, all right, everyone is going to be fired and then everyone walking around, oh, retrenchment is happening. All right? Maybe it's me, maybe it's you. Oh, we're surely going to be retrenched. And everybody's worrying. Look at your job, you know. I think your job is going to go. And you see a fear in everybody's face. Or maybe you go to the hospital and, or the doctors, and then the doctors tell you, well, you know, I really have bad news. Then you look around, everybody's in, in, in very bad situation in that clinic. And you're seeing the doctor in that clinic for a specific illness. Everyone's like that. You have all sorts of fears. Or rather, everyone around you is scrambling. Everyone is worried. Oh, this person came to defy Israel. What? We stand no chance. How does it influence you? David did not have an ounce of fear in him. When people, when the Bible describes, they were so afraid. All right? They, are not, they were not just afraid. This saw means they were, they were tremendously, greatly, overwhelmingly afraid. So you're not talking about someone walking up and, and just showing some fear. It was that kind of fear. All right, look at verse 11. The people were, they were dismayed, so discouraged. There is really no hope. There is no chance we can win this guy. They were greatly afraid. Again, that word. Now, when people panic, you know, like even in, in the unbelievers' world, they panic when there is, well, something happening. And then they'll panic. They'll sell, they'll buy, they'll, whatever it is. How does 
The Christian who sees God as a living God respond in his heart. Just a very clear mind. When you have living faith, your thought process, when everybody is running around like headless chickens, in panic, in fear, it will not influence you at all because your thought process is always entrenched on, overwhelmed by, not people, but the fact that God is the living God. Christian, when we don't have that grasp of reality of God as a living God, we can be Christians for, for tens, for decades. And yet, whenever there is a problem, we panic. Like the rest of the world or other believers. Because of this problem, God is theoretically true, but not real, not living to us. Not, he has not sunk into us and taken over every fiber of our being. You know, once I remember in a church that I was helping out in when I was a FABC student, they, they, they have uh, children, all right? This, um, they were taught Sunday school, and then the parents shared, you know. They were so ashamed, they said. Well, they were discussing some financial problems at home, all right? And one of them also had some uh, physical illness. So the situation was very difficult. Their faces were very long, brows, you know, squinted and just troubled, very troubled. They were talking in, in quiet tones um, to each other. Oh, how, what are we going to do? You know, this, my salary, all right? I may lose my job and your illness, you know. Will we have any place to, to even live in, right? Don't know whether our relatives, and so on and so forth, all right? Full of fear. They were really very afraid. It was a dire situation. But they didn't realize that this daughter, this young little daughter of, of theirs, all right, um, preschool daughter, right, was listening. And then suddenly this little girl said, Daddy and Mommy, don't worry. She was smiling. Don't worry. I'll go to the room now and I'll tell God about our problems and ask Him to help us. Daddy and Mommy, don't worry. And then she just um, trotted off to her room. The child just learned about God in church. The child just learned about the reality of prayer. You are not praying to the wall. You're not praying to your teddy bear. You are praying to the living God. He lives. He hears. He, he knows. And he can act. He is not an idol. He is real. You see, this childlike faith, God was a living God to her. Her response in the midst of all the problems. Now you may say, ah, you know, children, they don't know anything. The reality of life is not like that. I think we need to learn from this child. When our view of God, like this child, is something that is, God is living. <laughs> that is a truth that just pervades her entire soul. There's no doubt or question about it. Her only response was, there was no fear. Just hop to the room and tell God about it. Now, Christian, how we respond depends on how we think about God, like this child. This child's thoughts were so simple and clear. We get muddled by the fears of men. We get influenced by them. We get dragged down. And our thoughts will suddenly become all messy and chaotic. Christian, let us have this very real grasp about God. When you pray, when you read the Bible, read it with that consciousness that God is the living God. Every time you read and say, no, God, I'm, I'm, I'm losing sight of you as the living God. I'm just looking at stories. I'm just looking at um, um, things that like the events. But God, you are the living God. God, I must read and know you as the living God. Parents, when you conduct family worship, 
make sure your child, make sure your spouse, make sure yourself come to this grasp. It is not an activity at home, a religious activity. It's showing them the living God. So that is, well, the response, all right? Now think about the scariest situation that you're facing now. Or in your heart is impending, that may be coming. Whatever aspect of your life, your job, your family, your finances, your health, right? Any aspect. Think of the most powerful institution or body of, of uh, rulership, authority in this world that you are dependent on, so to speak, on earth. Think of what you are praying to God for. And then think about all these so-called powers of the world. And then think of God as the living God. Your thoughts will be crystal clear. You will have no doubts, no fear at all. Now, it's when we think about all these things and we see all these things, and see the response of people, like this child, see the parents, she can get worried. She can run away, oh, crying and say, oh, daddy and mommy, if daddy and mommy is worried, then things must be really bad, right? If daddy and mommy cannot solve the problem, then we are finished, right? No, she saw beyond all this. Think of the worst situation and think of the people that you think are the only people and the only organization that can help you. Then you move away from all that and think about the living God. Now we keep studying about God, right? Like this morning, God means He is supreme, authority, in control, all-powerful. Now all these things, we have to begin to then see God is a really living God that has these attributes. Now we move to the next point. What else must we learn? Now when we see God as the living God, we grasp Him with every ounce of our soul and our consciousness that He is the living God. Now we will begin to make decisions um, totally independent of situations or people. Not only will our thinking be clear, our thinking may be clear, all right, but it does not mean that we will make decisions, make our choices based on that. But when God is truly so real, let's see how David responded, all right? Now, let us look at verse 26 now. We saw verse 24, the people were panicking, but David was just calm, collected, in control of his emotions because he know the living God. Now then, they say, verse 25, sorry, verse 25, and the men of Israel said, have ye seen this man that is come up? They were not specifically talking to David. Have ye, talking probably to the brothers and those other soldiers that were in the trenches, have you all seen this man? Now what was David's response? He simply said, look at verse, 20, um, verse 26. Now I say, the second part, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine? You talk about this man. Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? You talk about this man. All, Dave, all David's concern was when he asked who is this man. Now he's not saying that I want to know more about this man. Look at how he asked it. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? He added the word uncircumcised for a reason. Now, David said, it does not matter who he is. All I know is this is one who defies the living God. All I know is he's an uncircumcised means he's not a believer of Jehovah. He doesn't put his trust in the living God. He is outside the covenant. He is outside the people of God. I don't care. Why do you keep asking people, have you seen this man? Why do you care? about who he is when he is someone who is not a child of God, not, a peop, not part of the people of God. 
his response was totally um, not based, had nothing to do with who this man is. It's just who this man is, is in the sight of the living God, who this man is. That's all he cares about. He's an uncircumcised Philistine. Now, when God is the living God, everything that you hear, everything that you see, they keep asking, have you seen, have you seen? Then the Bible tells us, look at verse 23, David heard the words. David heard Goliath. And then the people ask in verse 24, have you seen? It doesn't matter whether David has have heard or seen. It's irrelevant. Irrelevant to how David is going to respond. Because after this, he's going to ask, let me go and kill this guy. All right, we know the story, all right? He will say, let me go and deal with this guy. His decision of faith to go and fight the giant was, well, not, well, all the things that were said about the giant was irrelevant to David. When you have a living faith, that is how you will make decisions. Now, in fact, look at, God would give the details about Goliath, all right, to emphasize to us that in the sight of man, in all human um, assessment, it is hopeless, all right? God wants us to see how man would see Goliath. So he gives us all the details to teach us the lesson. Stop looking at this. It's irrelevant. But let me give you the details to let you understand this. Now, look at his height, all right? Verse 4. Now, his height in today's terms would be he's about three meters tall, all right? I'm about 1.6, now 1.7. So, double my height, okay? Just imagine that. Three meters, about three meters tall. And then look at, then go on to describe his armor, all right? Look at verse 5. Helmet of brass. You know how heavy brass is, all right? For most of us, we put the helmet of his, we go like that. Helmet of brass, how strong his neck was. Then, look at, he was armed with a coat of mail. That weight, the coat of the coat was 5,000 shekels. Now, this will be about, well, depending on the measure, how people measure, the old, old measurements, you know, it's about between, well, 50 to 70 kilograms. Right? 50 to 70 kilograms. About our weight. And that is what he just wear, you know, like, you know, we put on a, a jacket, and then this is like a few ounces, that's about it. But he's wearing the weight of a of human, probably the weight of David easily. Means he can just fling David around, you know. It's just like you want to put on our clothes, you just fling it around. He could just fling any of these of this Israelites around, just toss them around like nothing. That was how strong he is. And then the description of the weight of this, of this, of this um, coat of armor that he was wearing, weave with metal and, and um, chains. Now, the description of this then will tell us that from what they um, understand of those days, this will be an armor that is weaved at least a thousand or more times. Means the weaving of the metal, of the chains, over and over again, probably a thousand times in order to reach this kind of weight. Now, not only that, his beam, right, his beam, is like the weaver's beam. People, they will remember, all right, we go to this shop and then this huge beam that is used for weaving materials. People use it as a machine to weave things. He used it as a, as a weapon. And that is just the, that is just the, um, um, the beam. There is still the spear, the spearhead, right? Almost probably 10 kilograms. For him to just fling around, to use as a, as a, as a spear. For most people, they can't even carry it, let alone use it as a spear. If they lift it up, they probably collapse under it. Now, all this description, what is it for? Well, to describe, when they saw, they saw, they saw this man, they fled. And then they will ask, have ye seen this man? That is how, when we don't have living faith, we will make decisions. They ran away. They, were, uh, they, they, they scurried back. They chose not to engage in battle. They chose not to carry on. They made their decision based on what they saw. The situation, the challenge, the giant, hopeless. 
But to David, why is this relevant? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? In the sight of God, he is nothing. Why is the situation, why is who he is, why is what he is wearing relevant at all to you all? Why? Now, Christian, when we are in a situation and we see that things seem to be beyond us, overwhelming, but when you have a real grasp that God is living, your eyes will turn away. Your, your heart and your attention will just turn away from, from all these things. You will just ask, now, how, how is it relevant? People tell, hey, you know, if you make this decision, do you know this will happen, that will happen? Then you will say, but God is the living God. Now, why is all this relevant? Why, why are you telling me all these things? They are not relevant. They are unimportant. Your decisions to act will purely be based upon He is the living God, and that is enough. That settles it. That is all that matters. Now, practically, what does it mean? What does it mean? Well, recently I asked a young person, You're applying for, are you applying for jobs yet? Well, I knew that the person has turned down several jobs, all right? Turned down jobs after jobs. Graduate, graduated, all right? To most people, say, turning, job, turning down jobs after jobs. What's your reason? Well, reasons are, well, this one, well, I think it will affect my spiritual walk. This one, I think it will, you know, it will make it difficult for me to, to live my Christian life. But it's turning down job after job. All right, what about now? Christmas is over. Are you applying for jobs? Um, yeah, not very big hurry, but I will think and read carefully, and I won't just jump into applying and jump into uh, any job that comes along. Now, when our hearts are so clear that we worship the living God, and we want to live for the living God, our hearts we just make decisions based on... Now, it does not matter if people are snapping up the jobs. Now, so others, would you think this way? You know, if I don't take a job quickly, what happens if this job gets snatched up by someone else in this situation? But, you know, I'm turning down more jobs. Then I look around my, 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 my um, friends. They've graduated and they're taking up, they're snapping up jobs in this area and it's a narrow area. More and more jobs are snapped up. More, less and less jobs are available. Now, do we make decisions based on that? Keep looking at the situations? Or maybe if you are someone who, is, who really needs a job, you're, you need to pay loans or financially, for whatever reason, what do you think of? I'm in this situation. So now I must make decisions based on that. Or you still make your decisions with a very clear heart. God is the living God. I do not need to rush into decisions that may eventually become, right, a sinful one. That is not God's will. Now, I'm not saying that, that we are encouraging people not to do anything, all right? But when God is real, you, you think and you choose and you decide and you act very calmly, knowing that He's the living God. What is there that could stop God from giving me a job when I want to obey Him? What is there that can stop the living God? You know, the Philistines and this giant, they have a far greater chance of conquering the whole world than they have the chance of defeating the living God. You know what I mean? They have a greater chance of conquering the whole world than defeating the living God. That is how David thinks. We have the living God, the armies of the living God. Why are we deciding not to go to battle for 40 days? Why are we running back when we engage in battle? 
don't we know that we have the living God on our side? So if you're looking for a job, if you're thinking of changing job, you're thinking, whatever situation of life you're in, making decisions for your family, making decisions as a single, always make it based on God is a living God. Always remember that. If you find that you're, you're panicking, you're rushing, you say, I, I better do this. What if I don't do this? I might miss the boat. You think God cannot control that boat? God the living God, the creator of this heaven and earth, this universe, that at this very moment, everything in the universe is under his maintenance. You think he cannot deal with this little problem that seems like the whole world of a problem to us? It is nothing. We studied in Isaiah and I repeat it again. God says, all the empires of this world put together in all history of mankind is less than nothing to me. So Christian, when we see God as the living God, all situations, people become irrelevant. All right? That is the key point. The key point. Now, but I also want to make sure that you understand. Now, we are not saying that you don't bother. You don't do anything. All right? David is not the person who says, I believe in the living God. And then after that, I just put my hands behind and don't do anything. The living God will take care of things. I'll show you an example of his life. Look at verse 19. Sorry, verse 18. Now, the fathers, they carry these ten cheeses onto the captain of their thousand and look how the brethren fare and take their pledge. Now, when David arose... All right, verse 20. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper. He left the sheep with a keeper. No, David, don't you have faith? He's the living God. The living God will take care of the sheep. All right? Just, you just go. No, he's someone who does his human responsibilities. He's a responsible person. All right? So don't think that um, someone who believes in the living God means... Uh, Daddy, mommy, I don't need to do anything. I don't need to study. Uh, you know, I don't need to work. I, God will take care of me. He's the living God. Now look at also in verse 20. When he reached the place, look at verse 22, sorry. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage. So when he reached there, he just dumped the carriage. The living God will take care. It's just a carriage. Carriages are nothing. He can control the animal um, pulling the carriage. No, he left it in the keeper's hand. Now, on the side... I hope that this teaches us to be responsible people, right? We should be people that, that when given a task, right, we do them responsibly, not carelessly. We can't say we believe in the living God and, like, and be careless. Now, what the point is this. All the human responsibilities we do, but as we do it in our hearts, we always trust in the living God. When David said, now who is this Philistine, this uncircumcised Philistine? He was saying with the intention to go and fight him. He's not just saying, oh, God will smite him down with a, with a lightning. He intended to do something. But everything that he said, how he felt, how he thought, was always just hinged upon, this is the living God. Whatever I need to do, I do not need to fear. So Christian, then we come to this last but probably the most important lesson. Now i ask you this. When you listen to faith, such a living faith, you say, oh, I wish I had such a living faith. God, give me such a living faith. I want to have such a living faith. All right? Now, why do you want to have a living faith? Why do you want to have a living faith? Why do you want to have a faith that is like that? That will cause you to behave and respond and a victory like that. Why? 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 Well, so that you know, God will heal me, so that God will give me a job, so that God will take care of my family, so that God will take care of my old age. Right? I must have faith because I must have faith to please God and God will then do this and that. Let's see what's David's reason. What drove him? What motivated him? What stirred him? What was the fire in him? Now, let us look at verse 26. 
And David spake unto the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that, walk, that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. Now, saying what? Saying what? They said in verse 25. Number one. The man who killeth this, the king will enrich him with great riches. Number two, will give him a daughter. Number three, his father's house will be free of taxes in Israel. And they said it again. Now, and David asked again. Now, is, was David saying, hey, let me, tell me, please tell me, what benefit will I get? What benefit will the person who killed this Philistine get? Now, please do not read it wrongly. David was not saying that for a moment. Look at David's Look at this situation. Look at verse 25. They just mentioned money, riches, son-in-law of the king, tax-free life. All right? Now, when David say, wait, wait, wait. What are you saying? What would be done to this man? And then he gave the answer why he asked in verse 26. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Number one. He's saying, this is someone who is a rejecter of God, defying God. Number two that he should defy the armies of the living God. What David is saying is this. Th this person is defying the armies of the living God. Now, in verse 10, he said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. In those days when they go to battle, when they say things like that, they're saying we are defying your God because they believe our God is more powerful than your God when we win the battle. So when I defy you, I'm challenging your God. If your God cannot help you, then you, your God is not as strong as my God. That is how it is. We saw it in the earlier part, in the earlier chapters. So to David, he's defying. He did not say, well, the armies of Israel, the armies of the living God. This army is engaged by God. This army fights for the honor of God. What David is asking is this. Are you serious? Because these people, they scurried back and all they could say was, hey, you know, whoever can kill this guy is going to have these three wonderful things in life. And when David said, what will be done? He's simply asking this, are you serious? There is this uncircumcised Philistine who is defying, who is dis defying, it means disgracing, all right, challenging the living God, the li our God who is the living God, the only living God. He is disgracing and, and um, um, reproaching the name of the living God. And all you can think about is what rewards will be given. Are you serious? Now, look at verse 26. David did not say, well, what shall be done? What shall be done um, to this man that taketh away the reproach? Now, he said reproach from Israel. All right? Now, he said, he did not say, well, you know, what should be done to this man? Because, you know, it's very risky, right? This guy is a giant. It's, it's almost impenetrable. Well, whoever who goes is risking his life, right? Well, what should be done to this man who is risking his life? No. He said, what should be done? His reason for asking was, how dare someone defy the living God? You know, he was so, um, um, the living God was so real in his heart. He just can't stop from thinking, it is ridiculous. And how can you stand by for 40 days and let this uncircumcised Philistine disgrace the name of the armies of the living God? How could you do that? Tell me. And uh, look at verse 27. They just don't get it. They just don't get it. They say, oh, this way again, this way again. David was probably very disappointed. So David was not saying, well, who, what shall be done? This person is risking his life. He said, how can you be talking about this when the name of God is being disgraced? Is that all you can think about? Are you serious? Then the brothers had the same attitude. In verse 28, oh, we know you. They did not see their brother's heart, their youngest brother's heart. They despised him. They did not see that they are so different from their younger brother. My younger brother is, has a heart burning for the living God, so great in faith about the living God. Instead, they mocked him. They judged him wrongly. Look at verse 29. And David said, what have I done now, he has to turn to the brother. Now, these soldiers, these soldiers, I just ask them, are you serious? That is all you think about when the name of God is defied. And then now you have to ask the brother, now, 
I just ask them, are you serious? And then now, what have I done? Have I done something wrong to tell people? Stop thinking about rewards. Think about the name of the living God, His glory. What have I done? Have I done something wrong for saying that? Now he said, in verse 29, is there not a cause? What is the cause? To make sure that the world, starting with the Philistines, know that these armies are the armies of the living God. Is there not a cause to fight for the glory of God? Which we will surely have victory? Is there not a cause? Now look at verse 30. And he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. And sadly, the people answered him again after the former manner. Christian, you know, sometimes when the living God is so real in your heart, you will find that people cannot understand why you're making those choices. People cannot see. He just went around probably grabbing soldiers. Now, is there not a cause? Why are you all waiting 40 days? Why don't we go out and redeem the name of the living God and He will surely redeem His name through us? Is there not a cause? They just can't see it. Now, Christians, why do you want to have such a faith? Many Christians say, I want to have strong faith. And we pray to God for faith. But it is not for the cause of God. Many of us desire such a faith and we pray for increased faith. It is so that, God, can you please let me not be so fearful in times of difficulties? When I face this problem, when I'm in this situation, God, can you help me not to be so fearful? God, can you please... You know, give me more faith to believe that you will help me, you will deliver me, you will take care of this problem in my life, in my job, in my family. God, give me more faith to believe in you, helping me to do and achieve what I want. Living faith is not that. We often have the concept of faith as simply don't have fear. No. Faith is about living for the cause of God. Why do you want to have faith? Don't just divorce. Don't just divorce faith, living the Christian faith with the cause of God. The reason why we want faith is, God, that we would, we would redeem your cause. We would exalt your cause. We would do all this that men may know who you are. That is the reason why we want to have faith. So when you read this, God even said, he asked the people again, is there not a cause? And the third time, the people just answered him by the former manner. I can only imagine David's nonplus disappointment. That's all they could think of. Reward for themselves. Christian, stop thinking about having faith as simply God relieving you of fear and helping you with what you need to do. When your burning desire is for the name of God, your faith will be living. Do not divorce it. Do not be a Christian that keeps talking about faith as only one thing. The word faith has a lot more than that. It's the Christian faith for God. Now, I'm not saying for a moment that everything that you pray for, God will deliver to redeem His name. We studied in 1 Peter very clearly. God made it very clear. When it is His will that you suffer, and when you do, because it is His will, the glory of God rests upon you. Remember that? God chooses what glorifies Him. All right? You don't arm twist God. God, you must heal me, then this glorifies you. God, we must, you must give me a job, then this glorifies you. What God chooses in our lives that will glorify Him, we submit to that. Remember that. Otherwise, you have a distorted Christianity. Is Every time you're sick, every time you're out of a job, every time you have a problem, every time your child is, is sick, God must make it better, better based on what we think. What glorifies God is up to Him. If sufferings, if trials glorifies Him, then let it be so. That is our burning desire. 
God then give me more faith to go through this trial. Then God give me more faith, more trust in you to, to uh, submit to all this that you have ordained in my life. Then God give me more faith that I may live out a faith that is for your cause, not mine. That is why we want to have more faith. I hope that we get it right and live so. Let us rise to sing the closing hymn. Shall we rise? Closing hymn 333. Shall we rise? 333. 333.